There are many different types of welding. In fact, there's over a hundred different welding processes in use today. And I'm going to break down five of the most common processes and show you exactly how they work. So welding is a way to join two things together and actually make them into one solid piece. Now, in order to do that, a welding process has to do three specific jobs. The first one is it has to have a highly concentrated heat source that locally heats that material without heating the whole thing up. So it has to be really hot. And this can be an electrical arc as is most common, but it can also be a flame or a laser beam or a beam of electrons. Now, when you melt the metal, it can interact chemically with the air. So the oxygen and other elements in the air can contaminate that weld pool. So the second job of any welding process is to protect that molten weld pool from any sort of contamination. And the third job is to actually add a little bit more material into your weld. So all of the processes we're going to look at today do those three fundamental jobs, but they do them in a little bit different way. The first welding process we're going to look at is oxyfuel welding. Oxyfuel is also known as gas welding because of the fuel gas that you use to create a hot flame and melt your metal. So usually this fuel gas is acetylene and it's stored in a tank and you also have a cylinder of oxygen. And these flow through twin hoses up to a torch and you need the oxygen and fuel to get the high temperatures and concentrated heat. So this is an oxyacetylene welding torch and it has two knobs to control the flow of fuel and oxygen. And you need to precisely adjust the ratio between the fuel and the oxygen. You can actually fine tune the flame for different jobs for this. But usually when you're welding, you want a pretty equal balance without extra oxygen or fuel that could affect your weld. The heat of the torch is used to melt your metal. And then there's some extra filler metal that you can actually add into that to build up your weld. And this is not a very common process today. It's fairly slow and inefficient. Um, but it is still used in some schools to really learn the basics of manipulating a puddle. So it's a good training exercise leading into other welds. And some folks who build uh, small light aircraft frames or race chassis still use oxyacetylene today. And it can produce a sound joint. I haven't welded with it in years, but uh, this is good fun exercise today. Now oxyfuel welding isn't all that common today. It's largely been replaced by some of the other processes that we're going to look at here in a minute. Now the oxyacetylene torch was invented right around the beginning of the 1900s and at just about the same time another key invention was created and that is the coated arc welding electrode. So this is the core piece in our next welding process which is shielded metal arc welding or more informally known as stick welding. Instead of a flame, stick welding uses an electrical arc to create that concentrated heat, and it has very simple equipment. There are just two wires that connect to the welding machine, which may either plug into the wall or be a generator, and one of them connects to a clamp like this to complete the circuit. You put that either on your welding table or your workpiece, and the other connects to an electrode holder like this that holds your coated welding electrode. Now welding electrodes are often called welding rods and there are many different types and sizes of them depending on the types of jobs that you're doing, but they're really incredible invention. The center is made of metal that's similar to your base metal that you're welding, usually steel, and on the outside of it, it's coated in a material called flux. So that center rod conducts electricity down to create your arc and when you touch your workpiece, it will begin an electrical arc and you hold a slight gap for that electricity to jump over, which creates an intense heat. And then that flux coating on the outside burns off to protect your molten weld pool from the atmosphere so it doesn't get contaminated. Now to feed additional material in, you actually manually feed that rod in as you go. So the center becomes your filler and that flux after it's consumed becomes slag. Sometimes this peels off easily and other times you need to use a tool like this called a chipping hammer to finish it off. So there are a lot of advantages to stick welding. The equipment is simple, it can be inexpensive, and uh, the process is relatively easy to learn. It's not the easiest by any means, but it is easier than others. 
Now, I would not recommend using stick welding if you are welding on material that's under an eighth of an inch or three millimeter stick. It's just too much heat and it doesn't work very well, but it does produce a really reliable, strong joint. Now, these electrodes are only so long, and so you have to stop and change them from time to time as you uh, run along your weld, and that can be a little bit of a loss of efficiency, but it is a very reliable process that's used a lot uh, still today especially in repair and pipeline type industries. It produces a very uh, sound, strong weld. Stick welding is still quite common for repairs and also in the pipeline world. However, it's largely been replaced by wire feed processes that we're gonna look at next. And the first one we'll look at is called flux core welding, which has a lot of similarities to stick welding. With flux core, instead of a stick welding electrode, you're using this wire that's basically a stick rod turned inside out. It has a tube of metal with a powdered flux in the middle. And instead of feeding it in manually, the gun, when you press the trigger, automatically feeds the wire out into your workpiece. So you don't have to stop and change rods and it's fed by a drive mechanism down in the machine, clear up through a tube. Now any MIG welder can run flux core, but you can also use some inexpensive equipment, which makes it great for hobbyists. This machine's right around $150, and there's some that are even less, and it's not really built for day in, day out work, but it can get you started on a budget. Flux core welding is a lot easier than stick welding to learn, in my opinion, because you just pull the trigger and the arc starts. You don't have to touch the end, and you don't have to feed it in because it's automatically fed in. You just hold the same distance between the end of the gun and your workpiece as you work your way along your joint. Now that said, it's still like any welding process, takes some time and practice and focused intensity to really learn how to do it well, but it's one of the easiest ones that there is. Now, I wouldn't recommend this for very thin, like auto body sheet metal. It can be done, but it's not ideal. It's really good on, say, a sixteenth of an inch or about a millimeter and a half and thicker. And that works in a lot of cases. Now, it is a little bit messier than some of the processes that we'll look at a little bit later. You still have a slag that needs to be removed, but it's a lot lighter than a stick welding slag, and it's pretty easy to remove. So this is one of the best uh, processes to learn if you're a hobbyist on a budget or uh, it's also used a lot in industry. Now, rather than using flux to protect that weld pool from the air, you can also use a gas that comes out around your arc. And the next two processes that we're gonna look at both use what's called a shielding gas to protect that molten weld pool from the air. The first one is MIG or gas metal arc welding. Gas metal arc welding has a lot in common with flux core and it even uses the exact same gun. Now the gun in this case uh, feeds wire out of the end, but it also is able to deliver gas. Now the wire that it uses is a solid wire instead of one with a core of flux. And in this case it's steel, though it's coated in a light coating of copper as most welding wire is. And the gas comes in a cylinder and in this case, it's argon mixed with carbon dioxide, but there are a variety of different gases depending on exactly what you're doing. Now, the gas itself comes out of that nozzle around the outside of the wire to protect it without the need of any flux. And equipment can range from this smaller 120 volt unit on top, clear up to larger industrial units like I'm using here today, depending on the thickness that you're welding. It's relatively easy to learn to MIG weld. That said, every welding process requires some practice and some good knowledge. So I have lots of resources on my channel and my website, my online courses that can really help to learn that. Um, but this is an extremely good process for all sorts of thicknesses. Notice there's no slag at the end because you didn't use a flux. So you can weld anywhere from thin like 20 gauge material clear up to uh, basically unlimited thickness though you need some different gases and things when you get over about a half inch. And the actual uh, process runs really smoothly. So if you're a hobbyist and you're not on the tightest budget, I think MIG welding is worth the extra investment in the gas cylinder and a little bit nicer machine than one that does flux core only. Though you can start with the MIG welder and flux core wire and move up and add gas later. But in industry, this is extremely common, most common process that I've seen. Now one of the drawbacks to MIG welding is you're adding heat 
and metal together. So anytime you're adding heat, you also have to be feeding that wire in and adding metal. And so you have a little bit less control than you do with oxy fuel welding that we looked at in the beginning where you're adding heat and then at the appropriate time, you add a little metal to it. What if you could combine the advantages of an arc welding process with the control of oxy fuel? That's what this next process is. It's called gas tungsten arc welding or more commonly known as TIG welding. And this is one of the most precise and versatile welding processes there is. And honestly, it's my very favorite uh, welding process to run. I really enjoy TIG welding. This is a TIG welding torch, and instead of a wire that feeds out, it has an electrode that doesn't melt. It's a tungsten electrode, and then a nozzle for gas around the outside. That nozzle is often called a cup. Now, the gas will flow around that electrode to protect it from the atmosphere, and you can very precisely control your puddle without having to add material to it. You can see the level of control that you have here. And with this machine and many of them, I actually have a foot pedal that I can use like an accelerator in a car to control the amount of amperage that I'm giving that electrode and really get an extra level of control. And this is helpful. Now, filler metal is added in the same way as oxy fuel, just with a rod that you manually add with your hand and you dab it in every so often as you travel along your joint. Now this can uh, make it a little bit challenging to learn. It is the most difficult process for most people to learn, though some people find it easiest, but uh, you have to coordinate really closely to keep from touching that tungsten electrode to the workpiece. Um, it's very close there, that was magnified a lot. And feeding the filler metal can also be a challenge to actually learn to feed it with your hand. So uh, lots of challenges there. The precise control lets you weld extremely thin material. These are the uh, knife edges of some box cutter blades. And notice this time I'm welding without filler metal. Often that's done. It's called an autogenous weld. And as I travel along here, I want to melt through, fuse both sides, but not uh, blow a hole. And that would be difficult to get a tiny little weld like that that makes it all the way through your material, yet does not leave a hole. Um, that'd be hard with any other process other than TIG welding, or you might have some special setup with a laser, but it does give that control. Now, it's also good on a lot of materials. This is aluminum. And the great thing about TIG welding is you can use it on just about any metal with the same torch, the same shielding gas, and the same welding machine. Now, aluminum in particular needs an alternating current machine. Notice that white frosty edge around the outside of the weld. That's from the alternating current actually prepping the surface to be able to weld. It's a really, really cool thing. And as I run my weld here, I get a little ripple every time that I add filler metal, and that's often called a stack of dimes in the welding space, and it's a really nice aesthetic for products. Now this uh, control and versatility uh, does come at a cost. It's typically the least productive process. You're often slower when you TIG weld. Um, the material has to be immaculately clean, much cleaner than other processes will uh, tolerate. You also have a difficult learning curve, and the cost to get into it is a fair bit more expensive in a lot of cases. However, um, you know, there's only one way to get that TIG welding aesthetic and to be able to weld a lot of products. So where is this used? It's used a lot in aerospace manufacturing, in motorsports, um, a lot of high-end things, and where a wide variety of materials or aluminum is used. Very common to see TIG welding there. Welding is awesome. Thanks for hanging out with me for a while. If you enjoyed this or learned something, let me know by hitting that thumbs up below or even better, leaving me a comment. I really appreciate that. It helps so much. And if you want to learn how to weld, um, there are hundreds of videos on my channel that'll help give you a lot of information. But the real way to learn how to weld is a step-by-step -step plan and process. And you'll find that in my online courses linked in the description below. I keep them as affordable as possible, just a one-time payment for lifetime access and no subscription fees after that. So check them out. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.